The next um, session is again equally important, uh, equally significant. I have already said a few words uh, earlier, but I will say a little bit no more now uh, about our uh, uh, keynote speaker, His Excellency uh, Professor uh, Brahanu Nega, uh, Minister of Education. Um, the bio I'm given, I'm just going to read it. The previous paragraph was just mine. It's just a, a very short one. Uh, this would be a more formal uh, biography that, uh, that uh, I am given. Uh, Brahanu Nega was uh, born 1st March 1958. He's a father of two grown-up children. He's an Ethiopian politician and the current Minister of uh, Education of Ethiopia. He has a Bachelor's of Arts in Economics from the State University of New York at New Paltz. He earned his Master's and PhD degrees from the New School of uh, Social Research uh, in New York City. While studying to obtain his PhD in Economics, uh, he continued to give special attention to his homeland by helping organize the Horn of Africa Annual Conference. After graduation, he took his first teaching position as an assistant professor um, of economics at Bucknell University, USA. In 1994, he returned to Ethiopia, working in the private sector, as well as teaching at Addis Ababa University until he was, oh, it's, as it says here, I'm going to read it as it says here, <laughs> until he was exiled again to the U.S. following his almost two years of imprisonment for his participation in the 2005 election, a major sacrifice for his country, representing the CUD. He returned to Bucknell in 2008 and became a full professor in 2015. While a full-time faculty at Bucknell, Brahanu always concerned with the current development in his country, uh, uh, also took time to help create a popular bi-monthly magazine called Mbilta and served as one of the editors. He is the author of a popular book from prison entitled Yenetz Annet, Go Sikat, uh, The Dawn of Freedom. After he came back from the US, he joined the Ethiopian Economics Association in 1994 and became its president in 1996. While serving as president of the EEA, he established in 2000 the Ethiopian Economic Policy Research Institute, the first independent economic policy research outfit in the country, and became its first director until 2005. In his rather very busy life, Professor Brano was a teacher, an entrepreneur, a researcher, political activist, and leader struggling for the establishment of a democratic political order in Ethiopia. He is currently serving as the Minister of Education of Ethiopia. With this uh, short biography, I now invite His Excellency uh, to deliver his keynote speech. بفقارون ستشلموت زي بفقارو بتفيه تمتع تماري اللهم إياك ويا يوم الدوري نو يس نا هو سيارج تواي هنا لينجي تاو كله but it is uh, it's a great pleasure to be a part of uh, this this ceremony this recognition uh, of death for a well deserved commitment to economics, economic education, and in fact, more importantly, to this country. So I, I didn't know, I was, I'll tell you a little bit about how I came to this, but I was not going to come. I'm so glad that I came because I became part of this, this ceremony. When I was invited initially to address this, this body. By the way, I don't know 
I don't know how to say excellencies in this and uh, so protocol is all observed and uh, all of you are excellencies. And, uh, so, <laughs> so when I get the, the invitation, I really, you, you know, part of me says, you know, you should go. It's an institution that you know very well and uh, you haven't been there for a while, so it's good to meet old friends and things of that sort. But the other part of me says, you know, you da you know damn well that you have no time to really prepare uh, a speech that is worth uh, keynote. Now I'm glad again that Mamo actually gave the keynote, so now I can I can have a little time to just play around with other issues that are not that important. That are not but I really didn't have the time till Wednesday. I was told that I need to be here on Friday. So last night I sat down and I started thinking about what is it that I'm going to say that can be considered useful for a bunch of economists. And I said, I don't have anything to say to them because I'm a serious critique of the economics profession, especially now. So I thought I would talk a little bit about the overall intellectual environment that we live in this country at this juncture in human history. And to see if I can raise a number of issues as a challenge to, to our um, academic colleagues to start thinking independently to address the real problems of the society rather than grab all kinds of fig leaves from these international conversations on economic issues. Not that they are not important, but I think it is very important that we recognize the change that are taking place around us and think out of the box to find what kind of solutions can we provide, what kind of thinking is needed at this moment in human history. I consider this to be a very complex, a very dangerous, a very confused world that we are living. This environment, it requires some serious new thinking rather than just simply um, borrowing from past thoughts, assuming that the knowledge that we have at, at one time in graduate school will always serve us till we die. Actually, the way the world is changing, it is absolutely clear that that's not, that's not the case. That we have to start really, really carefully think. So I thought I would say what these changes are and why, what kind of um, thinking they, they require, especially within the context of Ethiopia. And rather than give a solution, just raise a number of questions that I think we as economists in this country, well, I'm not an economist anymore, I think. Um, because I was introduced as a politician, so I'm not, not an economist. Anymore. I haven't practiced economics for the last seven years. Or so. That's why I'm a little bit saner than you would expect. So I, I would like to, to cast a little bit wide. I haven't. I don't, I don't have any prepared um, speech, but I've taken a few notes to, to talk about them. So if I ramble a little bit, so I hope you can be um, forgiving. Now, if we look at our intellectual environment as it exists now in this country, My general indictment is the intellectual class of this country is missing in action. It is not part of the conversation about where this country is going. It is not contributing in any meaningful sense to provide a direction about the challenge that this country is facing and in which direction it goes. There are a number of reasons why that has, that has been the case. But I want, I, I will raise a number of them a little bit later on. Toward the end of this discussion, I will try to say a few words about what we are doing, at least in my view and 
in my capacity as Minister of Education, what we are trying to do to regenerate, if you will, a more vibrant, free, intellectual environment in our country so that it would guide us to all the challenges that we are facing in the future because the challenges are really, really serious and require some serious thing. So I'll take three topics and I'll talk about these three issues. Now the first topic is Ethiopian academics in a changing global intellectual environment. How could we maintain or revamp the role of intellectuals in our public life so that they can play a productive role in shaping our thinking as a society to help us navigate through this increasingly complex, confused, and dangerous global and local environment? How do we make real intellectuals front and center in our public discourse? Not the educated degree holders, when I talk about intellectuals, I talk a little bit in a, in a more uh, nuanced way. I want to talk about three or four major changes that are taking place in human society that is going to influence the way we think about our life, our, our society, our economy, and so forth. So the first that I want you to ponder is the fact that we are living in a period of an ideological vacuum. If you look at the past 250 years of human history, three major ideologies have captured the imagination of human beings, and most of the conflict, both intellectual and political, were around these this three broad ideologies. Of course, first is liberalism. The second is communism. And the third is fascism. If you look at the past 200 or so years, political history and to a certain degree intellectual in engagements in social science revolve around these three broad ideologies. We live in a moment where all the three ideologies are more or less debunked or at least seriously challenged. Now, Fascism is not totally dead. We see all kinds of um, manifestations here and there by way of anti-migration and things of that. But no serious country or no serious people think that is the way to organize human society. So they are more or less in the fringe of this ideological discourse. Communism, as you know, starting from the 1990s, has fallen out of favor, even to those who have been ardent supporters of that form of organizing society, at least from the 1990s on. The, 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 the thinking part of it has taken place earlier, but more or less that was sealed by the 1990s and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Then I think what is important now is that liberalism, which has captured also the imagination of particularly the West, is now under serious constraint. If at all, it has not already died as an ideological uh, perspective. It's not totally dead. It is still there. But it is at a period of serious challenge. Human society is having a hard time believing that humanity is going to live in a way, in a direction that was envisioned by liberalism, centering on the individual as a unit that is important to organize society. So in this ideological vacuum, when there is no clear, simple guide as to how human society is supposed to be organized. Now we live with a big question. What next? What is the most important way of organizing or the most durable way 
of organizing human society. That is now a, one of the most important discussions that is taking place around us. And we, if we are interested in pushing this country forward in one form or another, our intellectuals have to be part of this conversation, part of this discussion. And I haven't heard anything in this country since I came, any discussion about what actually is going on around the world with all these ideologies in one form or another falling apart. What is the guiding principle of our human organization? That, that I think is one of the most important challenges, the intellectual challenges, the intellectual environment that we live in. And we are not up to that challenge as yet because we are not even having a serious conversation about it. The second challenging moment in terms of this, this existing international environment is this post-truth world that is facing us in an environment of rapidly changing technology that puts into question what it actually means to be human and the object of the human endeavor itself. You know, we are talking about the period of in terms of technology, cyborgs, right? I mean, that's not, humanity is not just only a biological being, it is going to be a mixture of biological and mechanical objects, right? I mean, the Noah Hariris of this world are talking about this changing uh, uh, human existence. Artificial intelligence is now the rail, right? I mean, what is it going to do to us as human beings? Um, and all this is happening in the moment of social media, where all the conversations are now moved out of the earlier uh, epistemic liberalism, if you will, into this vacuum. In societies that have very strong institutional uh, backing, institutional strengths, the debate is raging. It is at least there are still intellectuals that are debating about where this thing is going, what are we supposed to do in this environment? What kind of society is emerging, etc. We are sitting and watching this happen without having any conversation about it. Meaning we are just waiting for some new thing to come and impose its will in the same way that it has done in the past 200 years. And that is unconscionable for a class of people in a society that we call intellectuals. That is the second environment that is so new, so potentially dangerous, potentially existential, that we are not even having a meaningful discussion about it. Then there is a third challenge, which actually particularly uh, affects the way we think about the economy. The incredibly strained relationship between our understanding of human progress, human progress itself, which is largely economic, related to increased consumption, and our planet's ability to support such a self-destructive and voracious human uptime. In so-called this climate change and things of that sort is bringing a very fundamental question to the way we organize our thinking about the economy. Right? I mean, basic microeconomics, microeconomics, as you know, is based very importantly on a very important assumption called the assumption of non-satiation, right? I mean, human beings will always continue to consume and consumption continues and that's what the good life is. All of a sudden, we are facing this, you know, moment in human history where we all recognize that there is a limit to what this planet can actually allow in terms of consumption. In other words, the assumption of non-satiation is not actually viable. It is not sustainable. In that case, how do we build the economic models that we have learned in in undergraduate economics and in graduate school about human behavior, which is the basis upon which all the things that Mamo earlier was talking about in terms of practical economic problems require some implying understanding of what human behavior is. What are the motivations? 
for human beings when they act in a certain way. That requires a serious rethink. Right? Do our economic models, which are built, which we all are trained in, are they actually valid in the environment that we are facing as human society? That is another discussion that we are not doing in, in our intellectual environment. I don't know, I haven't looked at the most recent research in uh, the Japan Journal of Economics, but I simply instinctively know that that is not where our discussions and our mind is being productive. Then we have this very strange situation of the end of the post-World War global order, which is, as you know, fundamentally strength. The total capture of the post-World War II institutions, the Bretton Woods institutions and the thinking behind it, all that is now under serious question. Politically, geopolitically, but also in thinking it is being questioned. Right, starting from the basic assumptions of economics, but the very a number of issues that are a product of this system, including, for example, the most important question of inequality. How does how do we address this issue of inequality that is destabilizing societies all over? How do we deal with it as as a society? What would be our relationship with the rest of the world? In all these issues that Mamo was earlier talking about, in terms of balance of payment difficulties, and all that depends on how the international system works, and that is now changing and trade. And what is coming? What are we preparing for? Do we have any clue as to how this world is going to emerge in the next 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? Or are we always reacting in the short run? You know, even, even Keynes have a much uh, longer view, even when he said that in the long run we are all dead, so we shouldn't worry about it. But he still have a much longer horizon in terms of the way he's thinking about it. So are we thinking 20, 30 years ahead? What is going to happen? How does this international environment going to affect us? So all these changes and more, require a sober, reasoned analysis from our learned folks to navigate and survive through these uncertain and dangerous times. However, the nature of our current public discourse is more influenced by social media nonsense that real, meaningful, and learned conversation that could guide us to navigate through these challenges and survive as a human civilization and as a country is now at issue. With the intellectual class missing in action, who is going to guide us as a country through this challenging period in human history? That is one critical question that hopefully uh, you, you, would, you would reflect on. Because it is, it is not just about the long run, it is becoming increasingly urgent. We cannot just simply deal with short-term issues. Some people can address and must address short-term challenges, but we have to have a class of people who think a little bit further ahead and say, this is the direction where we are going. And that's what we are missing. We are missing in all fields, not just um, in economics. But the second item that I want to talk about is the economics profession and the changing political economic environment. Do we need, I hope this is one of the issues that you are going to discuss. Do we need to carefully reevaluate old models because of the problems related to the fundamental assumptions implicit in the construction of these models? As I said, for example, in, in relation to the assumption of endless consumption and things of that sort, which are the, the, the basic grains that our microeconomic models are built on, or our understanding of the way the economy works in general. But more important, can we develop a more relevant model, more relevant research 
That would help us practically address the key economic problems that we as human beings and particularly we as Ethiopians are facing. Can we continue to do business as usual, to do research as usual, funded research by invariably international organizations for one reason or another, mostly agendas that they, they think is worth funding without having any independent role in terms of the kinds of issues that we are doing research. I'm very glad to hear Mamo speak earlier where he talked about the attempt to make the National Bank of Ethiopia as also a learning institution. And I suggest to you, since you are having the money of this country wallet, one of the things that then that requires is to establish a significant fund for research, competitive fund for Ethiopians to start doing research, not by looking at the problems that others are telling us are the problems, but by looking at internally ours. We are not funding any meaningful research that is not funded by foreigners. I don't know how we can continue like this and address our issues. It's not enough that most of these institutions are taking our best and brightest, but it's, they are also dictating to a certain degree what it is that we have to do in terms of research. So my, the challenge that I'm, I'm uh, uh, throwing at you right now is given the challenge that I talked about earlier, it is high time for us to start to look inwards and start to say, what is the problem that we are facing as a society? Where are we heading? What is the influence of all these international events that are taking place? And how are we going to survive as a civilization if we are going to go one step forward? I really don't give a damn anymore about, you know, whether this microeconomic model is changing this or that. I want us to do research that is directly relevant to our lives. You know, I was, I was listening to the BBC this morning very early about the total collapse of the, the, the drinking water system in Uruguay to the point where officially the Uruguay capital, Monteverde, is under warning that they should not drink the official water because of the two or three years of drought that has completely depleted the water supply of the capital. So they have done some other, um, you know, attempt uh, to get some water from other rivers, which was actually mixed with the ocean water, so therefore the water that is coming to the city is undrinkable. This can be tomorrow, this can be Ethiopia, number of cities in Ethiopia. Already we know about the water problems in a number of cities. Those are the issues that we have to deal with. Those are the issues that will survive as a nation if we can do X, Y, and Z. And here is what we have to do. Now, can economics as we know it, that's the other thing that we need to, we need our, our economists to think about. Can economics as we know it solve the problem of inequality that is destabilizing human societies? Do we really have a clear idea as Ethiopian economists to provide current advice to policymakers as to how to navigate our economy within the context of a changing global economic environment? All the topics that uh, Mamo was talking about earlier are immediate short-term problems, but we have long-term problems that we are not even touching. And they are going to be a serious short-term problem soon, and it's not going to be very far. So our economists must be able to provide some kind of guidance towards this, these issues. Now, and as, as, as you do this, some of the things that you can do I mean, I was just uh, part of the team of uh, uh, federal government officials who were auditing 
the regions. And I was assigned in Oromia, and um, we were looking at this, this uh, uh, cluster farm, this huge amount of uh, farms that are collected from the piece of land from different peasants and organizing it to use uh, mechanization and what have you to increase productivity and things of that. Uh, now, I asked, is there any study about it? Is there any research whether, not only whether it is productive now, but whether it can be sustainable? Right? I mean, this is an old idea, as you know, this is the old idea of uh, uh, cooperative uh, farming that we have been doing for a long time. And if it works, and if it can be sustainable, then it literally, to a certain degree, is a contribution to knowledge in terms of how to make socialism work. Right? In a way. I mean, that's... Uh, uh, it's, not, it's not just for, for, uh, for Ethiopia, it's, you know, is it possible to work around, okay, now, can you please stop? Um, and I, I, I really was interested, I asked them, is there, is there research being done? Not about what the output is, for example, in the last year or two, how many hectares are being but is it sustainable? Why wouldn't it regress towards mediocrity as most cooperative farms in the past have regressed in the sense that the weak, the lazy farmer becomes the one that sets the pace in terms of work and the whole thing collapses. That's what we have seen, right? Across the board from the, the, the emergence of collective farming in the Soviet Union. Is it gonna work in Ethiopia? If it works, it's fantastic. It's great. At least it would help us avoid this big debate about land policy and things. So that if agriculture can, can increase. But I don't see anybody doing research in terms of uh, you know, whether this thing is working. This is what economists are supposed to do, to say, OK, this thing might work, this might not work because of x, y, and z, so that you, know, you, are, you, you, know, you have to plug in x, y, z as solutions to stop it. This is what I am interested to know. This is the kind of thing that economics economists are supposed to do. I think my time is rapidly going away, so let me be a little bit more quick. Now, the other thing that, that interests me is, is EEA engaging in any one of those? This is association of economists. We do, I mean, I, I was looking at the, the motto of the Economic Association in the Research Institute, and from that motto, I gather this is what the association is supposed to, right? Is it actually doing it? If not, why not? And what is it that we have to do uh, to help in this sense? So the third issue is related to the role of professional associations themselves. Now, I don't have to tell you much about professional associations, because you know, we are now a living example of what professional associations can do and what, how the state reacts to these professional associations. The economic association, uh, with all praises about its success in building a very important economic uh, uh, professional association, very quickly the government didn't like it, and all of a sudden we became, we, we, we fell like, you know, a weak leaf, so that we cannot challenge the state. We just simply say, okay, now, the mode is how to survive, and the way to survive is not to touch the state, right? Stay away from it. Otherwise, they would not let us do it. Is that what professional associations are about? Are we there to be servants of the state, or are we there to be independent institutions in order to provide uh, what we believe, at least professionally, what we believe is the right thing to do, to give advice, what Bef was talking about earlier, what Mammo was talking about. That requires guts, that requires taking your professionalism seriously. Right? Because the state, it takes us a while before the state really fully recognizes that we have as much stake in society as people in power. But we have to assert ourselves, we have to assert and say, no, we are going to do this research, this is important for our country, and things like that.
as associations, we have two important responsibilities in my view. The first is to keep the integrity of the profession itself. Whether it is in terms of teaching, in terms of research, and things of that sort, that the economics profession has a high level of integrity and rigor and all that. That is, that is the first thing um, that we need to do. And the question becomes, are we doing that? Do we have any say about economics teaching as such? Or is it somebody else who is con controlling the, the, the process of economic teaching and the evaluation of uh, how economics is taught in, in our institutions? Um, how, what is it that we have to do to make sure that professional associations are taken seriously by the state and by society in general in terms of uh, you know, getting learned advice? I mean, if you engage just like every other person in social media and your advice is based on what you gather from social media, then you are not credible, right? I mean, you have to do real research and show the numbers, show what actually is happening so that there is, we have to a certain degree to earn respect from the state, while at the same time as citizens, we have to also uh, make the state function as it should by listening to professional advice and professional now, so in, in this context, what are we do, doing as in the uh, uh, Ministry of Education? I mean, our main concern has always been from the beginning, from the time that I was, I was appointed as a minister, the first concern was we need to have a place, a safe, secure place for our intellectuals, for our thinkers, to think freely. To think freely without any fear or fear from anyone. Without any interference from politics, without any interference from tradition, without as much as possible with freedom from poverty. There are three issues that are holding our intellectual discourse in serious uh, disrepute. One is the political interference in our institutions that you all know. Two is the interference of tradition in our thinking. You know, the whole idea of university and academic life is to think freely. But we are afraid. Oh, if I say something about the church, what are they going to say? I'm going to be excommunicated or shit like that. You know? We can't be a society without having a place where free thinkers get together and think freely and communicate and converse freely and give us direction, the rest of society, some direction about what is the right way to go. We don't have that. So our first aim is we have to make the universities that. We have to make, to protect the universities in such a way that they are autonomous to pursue knowledge, to pursue truth, as they say, without any interference from these institutions. And one of the big reforms, as you know, we are doing is in order to achieve that, we have to make the universities autonomous, autonomous from the state. And this is the thing that we are doing now. Now, what amazed me in this process is most of inter our intellectuals are not even clear about what it means to be an autonomous university. Most people thought to be autonomous is to be free from the procurement policies of the the Minister of Finance. To be autonomous means for most people to be free from civil service in terms of allocating salaries and things of that sort. Now, all those are important for enhancing that value of the autonomous university. But the purpose is not that. All those are supporting elements. The purpose is 
the need to have a space. That's what academics is. That's what universities are. A space where people can think freely. And through that thinking and the conversation that they have within the thinking people, then would guide society to a certain direction. That is what we don't have. And the most amazing thing for me is once we started, and we have been doing this study for the Autonomous University for the last uh, two years, three years, since I was the board of Addis Ababa University. And even when the government finally agreed, yeah, this is important, we are going to do, we need these centers, the universities have to be autonomous. Addis Ababa University is going to be formally, officially autonomous in the next two, three months. And I'm sure there are a lot of you in Addis Ababa University who teach in Addis Ababa University who have not participated in one thing about how this autonomy should go. It's as if this, uh, you know, I, I used to call it Magagar, you know, this is Medenzes. This thing has set in in such a way that nobody really thinks things would change. People assume, yeah, 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 autonomy, we have heard it, you know, before. There was Kaizen, there was all these reforms and things, what changes? They are in the same place. And this, in my view, a monumental change that would affect our intellectual environment and thus our, our society eventually, that we are not pushed and pulled around by someone on a computer from some, some you know, boondocks in Norway or something and tell us what our life should be. And we just simply parrot that. Nobody is telling us how our society is supposed to be organized and how we should think about it. It is that environment that we're in. And so, at least at the, uh, the, the Ministry of Education, our aim is, one, for these universities to be a really serious learning institutions, we have to improve the quality of education at the, the, higher, the general education level, so we'll do that. But in the meantime, let's start this. That is what scares the hell out of If our academics, if our intellectuals are that, if they are just sitting and waiting Assuming that change is not possible, even when they are told, here is, a, here is a thing that you can implement, then we are in trouble. So my hope is, whatever you think about government, and I'm sure if I ask, if I put out a little poll, there are one million different ideas about what people think. You can hate Abi to the tilt. I, have, I don't care. That's not the issue. The issue is we have only one country, and we mess it up, and we are guided by these knuckleheads who are sitting in a computer and telling us about all these things, rather than you, the educated people of this country, the learned people of this country, being front and center in the conversation of this country about where it should go, whether it is in politics or in economics or then we are going to be in real, real trouble. So my parting words to the Economic Association and to all professionals in this country is let's start to take our vocation as professionals seriously. Let's be part of the society and contribute from that learned position without in any way being afraid or worried about what others think of us. Insofar as we are guided by data, truths, the search for knowledge, then this challenge that I talked about that are really encroaching on us, if we don't address them, will take us to the others. And I hope you will contribute significantly to this. I hope the Economic Association, the vision that we have for the Economic Association, to be that, to be that place where not only just academic conversations would take place, but conversation with the public. I remember when we published, when we started publishing Economic Focus, I don't know, is it still around? The idea was actually to have a conversation with the public on economic matters. I don't know whether we are doing that, but it's about time to, to, to broaden our thinking, to start communicating with the public in terms of what are 
the better ideas that will take us forward. I'm really sorry I took so much time.